we're going to talk about, continue to talk a little bit about civil rights. And we're going to move into school segregation of Little Rock, Arkansas. And the reason why this is important is because with the passage of the Supreme Court decision of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, it stated that nationwide it was illegal to segregate schools. And I mentioned to you that most schools tried to adhere with the new policy, however schools in the Deep South resisted. And this is our first example of schools in the Deep South resisting that Supreme Court ruling. And it's really the first real crisis concerning civil rights during the Eisenhower administration. And it occurs in Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, some of you may have heard this story before, depending on other classes. Sometimes this comes up in other curricular areas. But what happened, in 1957, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, despite that Supreme Court ruling, refused to allow nine Negro students to enroll at Little Rock Central High School. Okay? So despite the Supreme Court decision, on Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which desegregated schools, despite that ruling, in 1957, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, refused to allow nine Negro students to enroll at Little Rock Central High School. And he got serious enough about this that he mobilized the Arkansas National Guard solely to prevent these nine Negro students from enrolling. A little bit of intimidation, okay? So he even mobilized the Arkansas National Guard to make sure that these nine Negro students did not enroll at Little Rock Central High School. Now your first question might be, well, why in the world would the Arkansas National Guard violate the law concerning that Supreme Court decision? Do they take their orders from the president directly? No, they take their orders from who? The governor. And so they don't take their orders from the Supreme Court or Earl Warren. So when they're asked to mobilize, they mobilize, and they did so. Well, who has to get involved now? The president of the United States. And what President Eisenhower does is he acts on the issue, and he ordered in military troops to Little Rock, Arkansas. And what did those military troops do? Anybody want to guess? They escorted the kids to classes. Escorted them to classes. Can you even fathom that in your mind? That the governor of Wyoming would deny a certain demographic of student to come to Worland High School, and he would be so serious about it, he would mobilize the Wyoming National Guard, and the President of the United States would bring in military troops to escort you to class. You can even imagine that, but that's what happened. Now, afterwards, short after, shortly afterwards of this issue in Little Rock, Arkansas, Congress passed another Civil Rights Act called the Civil Rights Act of 1957. And the main thing, I guess, the main purpose of the Civil Rights Act of 1957 was to establish a civil rights division within the Department of Justice. Okay? It established a civil rights division for the first time in American history within the Justice Department. Now the Justice Department or Department of Justice is where the Attorney General resides and they deal with matters of law in the United States. And one of the laws in the United States right now is what? You, can't, you must desegregate schools. So basically what's going to happen by establishing a civil rights division within the Department of Justice is it's going to empower federal officials to prosecute individuals if they deny a citizen's right to vote or infringe upon their right to vote or don't follow the law considering civil rights. It now gives the Department of Justice some uh, power to prosecute those people. So if you were someone that would not allow a Negro to vote in Alabama because they were Negro, you could be arrested and, pro and prosecuted for that through the Department of Justice. Now we're going to get into the 1960s when 
Robert Kennedy becomes Attorney General under his brother, and you're going to see several examples of how he has to use the Department of Justice to take care of some of these people that are not following the law concerning civil rights. Any questions on what happened in Little Rock, Arkansas? Okay, that'll take us to a presidential election, 1956. I think you'll find this interesting. Election of 1956. Now, the presidential candidates in this election are going to be the exact same as in the election of 1952. Franklin Roosevelt, or excuse me, Franklin Roosevelt. Holy smokes. Dwight Eisenhower is going to run for re-election for the Republicans. And Adlai Stevenson is going to run again against Eisenhower for the Democrats. Okay? So you'll have Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower for the Republicans, and you're going to have Adlai Stevenson again for the Democrats. Now, Eisenhower is going to keep the same vice presidential running mate in Richard Nixon, whereas Stevenson is going to make a change. Okay? So Eisenhower will continue to run with Richard Nixon, senator from California, whereas Stevenson is going to change his vice presidential candidates. And it's going to come down to one of two men. The first man you've probably never heard of, Senator Estes Kefauer of Tennessee. So Stevenson is going to choose between these two people to be his vice presidential running mate. The first one, Again, Senator Estes Kefauer of Tennessee. How many people have ever heard of Senator Estes Kefauer of Tennessee? I'm guessing nobody, okay? But you've certainly heard of the guy that he's going to compete against for the vice presidential nomination. Anybody want to guess who that was? A young senator from Massachusetts by the name of John F. Kennedy. Okay? So the two possible vice presidential candidates to run with Stevenson in 1956 will be Senator Estes Kefauer of Tennessee and Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. Now, you would think, knowing what you know about Kennedy, that he would be, without question, the choice, right? Well, anyway, the reason he didn't get the vice presidential nomination is some powerful man campaigned against him. A very powerful man in America, a very wealthy man in America, very well-known man in America, campaigned against Senator John F. Kennedy. And because he threw his money around and threw his clout around, he was, he was able to kind of sabotage John Kennedy from being the vice presidential candidate. Anyone guess who that powerful person might have been? Sherman. No, not Sherman Adams. I'll be really impressed if you get this. Very powerful man, a lot of money, threw his money around, did not want John Kennedy to have any part of this nomination. He loved, the, he loved John F. Kennedy like a son. His, dad? his father, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., campaigned against his own son under the radar to make sure that he was not the vice presidential running mate of Adlai Stevenson in 1956. Why would he do that? Okay, you both are semi-correct. He didn't want his son, he, well, he didn't want, he wanted his son to become president of the United States. So why would he, why would he not, why would he campaign against him to kind of be the vice presidential nominee? Why would he do that? How? You're right, but how? Because he sucks as a person. He's not, he's, he, he's against the little heart. No, you're getting there. So how would he hurt John F. Kennedy? By losing. By losing. That a girl. Joseph Kennedy knew that Adlai Stevenson had no chance to win this election. And so he didn't want his son associated with what? A loser. A loser. Because he thought that would hurt him someday being elected president of the United States. So his dad actually went out and made sure that his son did not get the Democratic nomination for vice president in 1956 because he knew Stevenson was going to lose. And he did not want his son associated with a losing ticket. Did John know about that? Was that I think it, he will. He soon figured it out. Okay, And he wasn't pressing for this like that. 
greatest thing in his life. But you, we're going to find out a lot about Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. in the future here that you're going to understand maybe just a little more. So, because of that, Estes Kefauer will be Stevenson's vice presidential running mate. Now, once these candidates were settled, the Democratic Party's entire campaign was to criticize President Eisenhower's administration. Easy to do when you're not in office, right? And I'm going to give you several examples of what the Democrats said during the campaign that were critical of the Eisenhower administration. Okay? I'll give you examples of how the Democrats criticized the Eisenhower administration. That was the whole campaign strategy. Okay? Now I want you to listen to this before you write it down because if you start writing it down you won't get the gist. Number one, the Democrats charged that President Eisenhower had his hands on his golf clubs, fly rod, and shotgun more than he had his hands on running the government. And that was true. What, what did we talk about? What kind of a leader was he? Do Hands off. Do your job. Only bring the important things to me. So again, now if you want to write it down, the Democrats charged that President Eisenhower had his hands on his golf clubs, his fly rod, and his shotgun more than he did have his hands on the government. He was an avid golfer, avid fly fisherman, and liked to shoot skeet or trap. Those are so hard. Yeah, but he was he was good at them and he did them a lot. Okay? And so that was their first criticism. You know, the guy spends too much time golfing, too much time fly fishing, too much time shooting ski, doesn't spend enough time running the government. So the more catchier phrase is they charged that he had his hands on his golf clubs, fly rod, and shotgun more often than he had his hands on the government. Okay? Which is probably true. Number two, the Democrats criticized the Republican stand padism. The Democrats criticized the Republican stand padism. What does that mean, stand padism? Yeah, I'll give you an example on civil rights. What did the Republican Party do for civil rights from 1952 to 56? They didn't do anything bad, but they didn't do anything good. They just kind of stood pat, marked time didn't get involved because it was a little bit what? Controversial. Very good. Now, give you an example of that. This is what one particular Democrat said about the Republican president. He said, the only order the ex-general ever gave during the last four years was to mark time. The only order the ex-general had get, ever given ever gave, excuse me, during the last four years was to mark time. What's it mean when you mark time? Standard. The standard, okay, if I, right now I'm afraid that if Mr. Sanford walks in here, he's going to be critical of my lecture, I'm just going to mark time, so I'm just going to go like this. And pretty soon if I wait long enough, it'll be time for the bell to ring, and I won't have any chance of him coming in and criticize me. If he comes in, I'm just going to be... Is marking time? Are you still there, Mr. Sanford? That's marking time. So again, the only order the ex-general ever gave during the last four years was to mark time. What else might they criticize about the president? Let's think about it in general. We talked a little bit about his profile. What um, they campaign on the No. So, what might be a concern? What's that? Well, you could get on him about his cabinet. That's a good point. Was it his religion? No. What do you have? What do you have that nobody can really tell you what to do? You have your what in religion? Uh, what? What? <laughs> what? What do I have? It's only mine. Hair. My health. Oh. Okay. What did they criticize? His heart problems. His, that's very good. His health. Yes, he actually had had. Listen up. He had had a mild heart attack in 1955. Not a major one, but a mild one, okay? So they questioned his fragile health. Was that legitimate? Yeah, yeah I mean, it really was. Now, that leads us to our fourth thing they criticized. What might be their concern that he's in fragile health? He's going to die. The vice president? Very good. You guys elect this poor, unhealthy Eisenhower. If he dies, you're one death away from Tricky Dick Nixon. 
That's what they called him. Nixon was very untrusted at this time. They called him Tricky Dick Nixon. And they were, nobody really liked him. Richard Nixon didn't like him. They didn't trust him. And he was a little bit of a shyster, to be honest with you. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the Nixon years. But their point was, number three, Eisenhower's in shaky hell. Had a heart attack in 1955. Number four, if he dies, you're stuck with Richard Nixon as your president. Who in the world would want that? That's what they campaigned on. That's what they campaigned on. Now, did Eisenhower campaign real heavily? Huh? No. You know what his great? You know what his greatest asset was? His smile. I'm not kidding you. He doesn't have a smile in the picture here. But if you ever see, a, if you ever see a picture of Dwight Eisenhower smiling, he, he's everybody's grandfather. I mean, I'm not kidding you. He was very, very popular. So the biggest asset the Republicans could have in this election was simply Eisenhower's grin and his popularity. That was what they campaigned on. He was very popular. He didn't have to say much. He just had to show up. Okay? Now, this was a worse defeat for Stevenson than 52. When you talk about the Electoral College, Eisenhower had 457 electoral votes to Stevenson's 73. Yeah, 457 to 73. And I'm telling you, Adlai Stevenson was a good man and a very good politician. His problem is he ran twice against Eisenhower, and Eisenhower was way too popular. So he loses 457 to 73. You know, it gets worse than 1984, though. What's that? It gets worse than 84. I don't know. It does a little bit. Now, the problem with Eisenhower is he really suffered four really uh, serious disadvantages in his second term. Things didn't go as well for him. And four things happened to him in his second term that really hurt his presidency. Not horribly, but did. What would be the one thing that would concern you if you're re-elected president? Right off the bat, what would you be looking at? Congress. And it just so happened in the election of 56, it changed, and the Democrats gained control of Congress. So that was not a positive for him. So the first thing that happened to him that was a disadvantage is the Democrats controlled Congress. Second thing is he began his second term in pretty fragile health. He was not very healthy. Not very healthy. No, I have to. You'd have to look and see in your notes when he was born. I can't remember what was it. Somebody looked at the book. When was he born? What date? He looks pretty old in his picture. Be careful here. We're going to figure it out. Oh gosh, not over 14 to 1890. 1890 to 1900 be 10 years, and then this is 1956, right? So he's how old? 66. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but he's in pretty fragile health. That was another disadvantage. His third disadvantage is one of those two members of his cabinet that was really, really good died of cancer. Anybody want to guess which one did? One of those two cabinet members that were considered excellent died of cancer. Which one? John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles dies in 1959, but obviously he suffered prior to that, so during the second administration, Dulles was sick quite often with cancer, and he died and was replaced by Christian Herter, who actually was a good Secretary of State also, but losing John Foster Dulles was a huge loss, and he wasn't himself, was he, during that second term, during the time he was suffering at all, okay? And the fourth disadvantage is his top assistant, Sherman Adams, had to resign under a cloud of scandal. It was really kind of a stupid scandal, but he did. He resigned under a cloud of scandal. What happened is he had taken a coat made of a rare African animal as a gift from someone that was a little shaky, and they accused him of taking it in exchange for favors. Rather than put Eisenhower through that process, he just resigned. Okay, but it didn't look good. You know, I mean, it looked good, but people resigned. Okay, so Eisenhower had to work this second term. He didn't get a, you know, do all the fun things he was doing. I'll give you an example. Of this. this is a great quote. You don't necessarily have to write it down, but 
When Secretary of State Christian Herter, who took over for John Foster Dulles, at, was asked about is Eisenhower doing more the second term than he is the first, here is his quote, he said, In his last years as president, Ike did a lot less golfing and a lot more governing. That's what he said. So, anyway, during Eisenhower's second term as president, Secretary of State Christian Herter was once quoted as saying, quote, In his last years as president, Ike did less golfing and more governing. Okay. All right. Are we okay there? Yeah. All right. Let's go to the race for space, and then I'm going to show you kind of a cute little video that has nothing to do with history to end today. Okay, the race with Russia into space. Some of this will be a little deja vu towards the end, okay? Okay, now we all have heard of the Russian-American space race, but where did it really start? Well, it started on October 4th of 1957. October 4th of 1957 is when this race for space or space race started, okay? October 4th, 1957. And what happened on October 4th of 1957 is Russian scientists shocked the world when they lifted the first satellite into orbit. Russian scientists shocked the world when they lifted the first satellite into orbit. And the name of that satellite I think you have heard was Sputnik 1. So on October 4th of 1957, Russian scientists shocked the world when they lifted the first satellite into orbit known as Sputnik 1. It weighed 184 pounds. 184 pounds, which isn't very big, actually. Now, that concerned Americans a little bit. But it wasn't until they launched Sputnik 2 into orbit that Americans began to go, oh my God. Okay, so Sputnik 1 concerned America.